been my honor to serve as the Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Justice Department's Environment and Natural Resources Division. Established in 1909 on the heels of the administration of President Theodore Roosevelt, our historic division now includes almost 600 attorneys and staff hard at work every day to enforce and defend our nation's environmental and conservation laws and programs. I'm joined here at the front by the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, and the Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General, Jesse Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you to both of you for your principal leadership of this department and for advancing the impartial rule of law, including by your support of strong enforcement of our nation's wildlife and conservation laws. Before turning the microphone over to General Sessions, I would like to take a brief moment to recognize another very special guest who's here today, our division's next Assistant Attorney General, Jeff Clark. Jeff, please stand. Next Thursday, Jeff will take the oath of office and be in his tenure as the leader of our historic division. Thank you, Jeff, for being here today. I'd also like to recognize several individuals from our division's law and policy section who made today's event possible through their tremendous efforts. Uh, Section Chief Karen Wardzinski is here, Stacy Stoller, David Galtieri, and Carolyn Woody from our division's law and policy section. Thank you so much. And let me also recognize Tom Ward, the deputy AAG in the civil division, whose uh, tremendous wildlife photography is on display here. Uh, Tom, thank you for lending that to us today. And we're also glad to be joined here today by many others from the Justice Department engaged in the fight against wildlife trafficking, including representatives from the FBI and the, D the DOJ Criminal Division. And we're also honored to have many representatives of the federal agencies serving on the President's Task Force on Wildlife Trafficking, including experts from the Interior Department, State Department, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, USAID, and Department of Homeland Security, along with many other leading experts from inside and outside of government. We're grateful to all of you for being here and lending your expertise to this important forum. We have an exciting and ambitious agenda today with special guests from around the world and indeed from around um, uh, the entire world. It's my honor to now introduce the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jeff. It's um, re really great to be with each of you today. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Department of Justice and to this important forum about combating uh, the scourge of wildlife trafficking. We are committed on that. Uh, we believe that we might be at a historic moment, uh, and if we weigh in effectively and the world unites uh, to confront this challenge, we can do something historic. If we don't, uh, we would be concerned about what may happen, and we would have great regrets. So before I start, I, I want to update you on the ongoing investigation uh, into the suspicious packages, uh, FBI, our Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Secret Service, Postal Police, Capitol Police, and our state and local partners are working tirelessly to follow every lead. I can assure you that we are dedicating every available resources to this effort. I'm receiving frequent updates from the director of the FBI, Chris Ray, and his team. And I can tell you this, we will find the person and the persons responsible, and we're going to bring them to justice. Two weeks ago, I had the privilege of representing the United States at the London Conference on Illegal Wildlife Trade. I was proud to lead a strong federal delegation uh, that, uh, that joined with 80 other nations to reaffirm our commitment in this fight. The President is firm on this issue, as you know. As I stated at the London conference, the United States views the poaching and trafficking of protected wildlife as a threat to good governance, a threat to the rule of law, and a challenge to our stewardship responsibilities uh, to this good earth. Ending this criminality with its devastating consequences is a worldwide conservation imperative. Shortly after he took office, the president issued an executive order that identified wildlife trafficking as an important category of transnational organized crime. We at DOJ embrace that charge he has given us. Poachers, wildlife smugglers, black market merchants operate all over the world. Their criminal networks cross borders, transport their illegal goods worldwide, and sell them to the highest bidder. The United States government, wherever possible, will take action with our partners worldwide to disrupt 
and dismantle these criminal networks. This illegal trade generates as much as $23 billion annually. Just one kilogram of rhino horn can sell for as much as $70,000 in some markets. And so these criminals must be stopped, and we can do it. Future generations must not say uh, that the actions of the nations of the world were too little and too late, while great species disappeared from our earth forever. We simply cannot abide such commerce derived from the illegal slaughter of protected wildlife to enrich criminals and the criminality around the world. Over the course of the last four decades, African element, elephant populations are believed to have declined from 1.3 million to less than 400,000 today. African rhino populations have declined even more dramatically. And over the course of the last century, Asian tiger populations have declined more than 90%. So the United States, under the leadership of the president, is committed to the fight to stop wildlife trafficking now before it's too late. While much progress has occurred, we acknowledge that many substantial challenges remain. And I'd like to just talk about a few of those. First, we need to close markets. Uh, to these products. We are leading the world, I believe, in cutting off the trade in ivory and other restricted wildlife items. We hope that more nations will follow. Profitable and too often illegal markets for these products provide the incentive uh, for the poaching to occur. Second, we need to cut off the flow of financing to the traffickers and poachers and their criminal benefactors depriving these multi-product criminal organizations, often their drugs and all other kind of crimes, uh, uh, whether from human trafficking also, uh, is crucial. Pat Hovakimian, the department's director of counter transnational uh, organized crime, joins us today. Pat, where are you? <laughs> I guess he's here. Uh, there's his blank seat right here. I guess. <laughs> He knows about it, i got to tell you. Uh, so he works along with the other experts every day uh, as we deal with organized crime uh, to block the flow of illicit funds from wildlife crimes. Third, we must do more to cut off the traffickers' transportation routes on land, air, and sea and block their use of the dark net to facilitate illegal trafficking of all kinds. The dark net is a tremendously advantageous development for illegal groups. Alpha Bay, we took down that dark net site. It had 200,000 sites where you could buy all kinds of illegal things on it. Uh, and, and, and we were able to shut that down, but they, they continue to pop up. Fourth, we need to take a, a good look at extradition laws and agreements. It should be exceedingly difficult if not impossible for poachers and smugglers in one country to escape prosecution by fleeing to other nations. This is really important. It cannot be that criminals can continue their illegal activities and escape punishment by going to a country that won't extradite them. And in fact, my personal belief is one of the great challenges we have in this world in the decades to come is to improve uh, extradition processes. People can't find ha safe havens and commit crimes all over the globe and run to a safe haven and be protected. Fifth, we need to consider enhancing criminal penalties for those who engage in this illegality. Serious wildlife crimes merit serious sentences. Regrettably, in many countries, arrests for these crimes are too rarely made, and sentences, if imposed at all, often are not carried out or insufficient. Sixth, we need to find new and better ways to tackle wildlife challenges in the nations the United States Department of Justice has identified as countries of concern and focus countries. This includes nations like Laos, where the Justice Department with funding assistance from our State Department colleagues, uh, recently deployed Mark Romley to be our very first regional resident legal advisor 
We have good names in the government. There's Mark, yeah, good. Uh, regional resident legal advisor. Can you tell your children that? I <laughs> hope you have them. Uh, and uh, counter, to counter wildlife trafficking issues. That's what he'll focus on is wildlife trafficking. He's a prosecutor in the Environment and Natural Resources Division who for the last three months has been on the front lines of our enforcement efforts in Laos. Seventh, we need the resources to get the job done. In London, we announced that the administration will fund more than 90 million in counter wildlife trafficking programs in the coming year. Uh, this is a substantial commitment and just part of the long-term United States effort to tackle this conservation imperative, and we hope others will join. So today we bring together experienced prosecutors, investigators, and government leaders who tackle wildlife crime or who have experience with other transnational organized crime groups. In addition, we have those from intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, academia and the private sector, who are at the forefront to protect treasured animals from poachers and the criminal networks that, that uh, advance this illegality. This is a very valuable assembly indeed. So what do we uh, hope to accomplish today? In our first discussion, we will hear from those who have been on the ground going toe-to-toe -to -toe against the criminal, uh, criminals profiting from this carnage. We will hear from leaders across the federal government, including Wayne Hettenbach. Uh, Wayne, did I see you over here? Yes. Uh, an experienced prosecutor who supervises the uh, Environment Natural Resource Division's wildlife crime cases. He brings so much to the table. Dave Hubbard, the special agent in charge of international operations in the Office of Law Enforcement at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Deputy Assistant Attorney General Bruce Schwartz, who serves as the department's counselor for international affairs and is fully informed on these issues, and there'll be many others. So we'll ask them, what are you seeing? What is working? What is not? So it's time to take a hard look at where we are, what we have learned from our efforts through the years, and ask the tough questions. What challenges um, is law enforcement facing on the ground in these countries where poaching and trafficking has become a crisis? How can we get better information? Often it's NGOs and friends in these countries that provide us the information we have in no other way. How do we close off the transportation routes that smugglers use to move their illicit products? How do we cut off the flow of funds to these criminals? So following our first discussion, we'll take a short break to look at the problem from a different angle. Uh, my good friend and film director, Ron Maxwell, um, uh, uh, has talked to me a lot about this. He deeply cares about it, and uh, he'll speak uh, to the power of film to shed light on wildlife trafficking's devastating effects and its ability to move public opinion. So I'm grateful, Ron, for your uh, uh, talking to me about these issues and uh, uh, introducing our pro film producer, Kate Brooks, uh, uh, for, uh, to share with us uh, excerpts from The Last Animals, her award-winning documentary on poaching. Congratulations on your award. After reviewing a segment of the film, Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General Jesse Panuccio, uh, number three, he's right in my right hand. Uh, Jesse is on, uh, holds a position as a, a third ranking position in the Department of Justice. And he'll kick off the second round, which will focus on identifying solutions, strategies, priorities for enhancing wildlife trafficking enforce, enforcement. At the conclusion of the forum, we will have an opportunity for open comment uh, from our distinguished attendees here today. So again, uh, we are pleased that you're here. I, as a result of um, uh, 
some of the matters that are developing today, I'll, I'll have to leave right now. I'd hope to stay uh, throughout the program, but I hope to return as soon as I possibly can uh, to participate. Thank you all for joining us in this important forum. And now let me turn to Acting Attorney General Jeff Wood, who has done a fabulous job uh, in leading this division. And Jeff, congratulations to you. Uh, uh, and, and we look forward to having you join us. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Attorney General Sessions, one more time for your remarks and for bringing focused, high-level attention to this critical conservation problem. Uh, the Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General will be chairing this first round table, and I will be asking uh, several of our participants some questions. Um, keep in mind that during these round tables, we will only be able to hear briefly from some participants. We've got a great distinguished group gathered here today, uh, virtually filling the room. So thank you so much for all of you, all of you being here. We certainly want to hear from everyone. So we have reserved time at the end of today's event for open comment. And after the forum ends today, those of you who are interested in continuing the dialogue will have an opportunity to submit written comments or materials to the department. Uh, so let's get going. As the Attorney General just explained, the first discussion will focus on identifying impediments to wildlife trafficking enforcement. I'd like to begin this discussion with Dave Hubbard, Special Agent in Charge of the Fish and Wildlife Services Office of Law Enforcement, a true leader in this field and one of the nation's preeminent experts on this topic. So Dave, in terms of law enforcement, Fish and Wildlife Service in many ways is at the tip of the spear. You investigate the cases that the Department of Justice prosecutes and Fish and Wildlife Service brings the scientific and technical expertise that's so crucial to this work. We'd like for you to begin this discussion by describing the different types of cases that you encounter. For instance, some cases are wholly domestic, while other cases deal with criminal activity abroad and wildlife that is later brought to this country. So could you please share some more of your insights on that? Absolutely. Good morning. Um, first off, uh, thank you for convening uh, this forum, and thanks to the Attorney General and the Department of Justice on behalf of the Department of Interior and Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, we greatly appreciate this diverse and um, knowledgeable group that has been brought here today to shed light on this very important issue. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement uh, is a single mission agency, and this is our mission. So to see these, uh, th this support for what we do is, uh, is, is, I think, a great step forward. Uh, to addressing some of the challenges that I think will be brought up today. Um, you know, our mission in short uh, states that uh, we're, we're here to protect the wildlife and plant resources through effective law enforcement of federal laws. And, um, and that, that's what we're here to, dis to uh, discuss today on this important issue. Um, the U.S. is a source, transit, and destination country for illegal wildlife throughout the world. And as such, uh, most wildlife trafficking touches the U.S., whether that's uh, physically passing through the U.S., exploitation of species that uh, originate in the U.S., or uh, connections through uh, financial institutions that are in the U.S. that these criminal organizations are utilizing uh, to conduct this illegal activity. You know, examples of, uh, uh, of the types of cases we work domestically uh, vary from region to region, from uh, big charismatic species, uh, bears, elk, deer, all the way down to uh, cactus. And it's everything in between. It's, uh, it's the large charismatic species and the, and the what we refer to as the less charismatic species. <laughs> um, not to them, I hope. Exactly. <laughs> They're just not as, uh, not as pleasant to look at. Um, in the U.S., we investigate uh, uh, crimes that uh, uh, involve species such as paddlefish, caviar, uh, that's worth big money throughout the world, uh, American jinx ginseng for medicinal purposes, primarily in Asia, um, cactus, as I mentioned, uh, eels that uh, are massive amounts of money and a, and a great threat to the fisheries here in the United States, uh, as well as uh, marine species such as sharks, for shark fins and the skins of the shark and for food, and a wide variety uh, of species that we work here domestically. Many of our species are sought throughout the world, um, such as reptiles, 
many of the of the of the reptiles in, indigenous to the United States are sought throughout the world for the pet trade. Uh, massive amounts of money involved with that, uh, smuggling, money laundering, and and, and every uh, other facet of, of a criminal organization. Our domestic and international agents investigated a myriad of cases. Um, that very dramatically dependent on the U.S. or the global region. We have active investigations right now throughout the globe, including the European Union, um, Africa, and throughout Asia, as well as throughout the Western Hemisphere. Cases involving ivory, pangolin, big cats, and parrot trafficking uh, catch the attention and are, are most often the ones that are talked about. But again, we, we, we see every species uh, throughout the world is being exploited uh, and sold at some point in the chain. In Southeast Asia, um, we've recently seen a, a very large uptick in the reptile trade between the U.S. and that region, where we've seen very, very large quantities of U.S. reptiles uh, being exported and smuggled out of the U.S. Uh, to Asia. So in short, we work a... Um, a wide variety of cases, both domestically and internationally, uh, on every uh, species, plant, and fish that anyone can imagine. Thank you, Dave. I may come back to you on another issue, but turning now to the prosecution phase, I wanted to uh, uh, get some input from Wayne Hedenbach. Um, Wayne, um, in terms of prosecution, cases investigated by agencies like Fish and Wildlife or Homeland Security or even the uh, NOAA, are then referred to the Department of Justice for potential indictment and prosecution. Prosecutions are handled by prosecutors in our environmental crime section like you or the U.S. Attorney's offices around the nation or a combination of the two. We prosecute a range of crimes, environmental crimes, at the Justice Department. But, um, Wayne, I'm curious, what would you say are the most challenging aspects of wildlife trafficking cases when compared to other types of crime? Thank, thank you, Jeff. And if uh, I wish the Attorney General was here and I'd like to say I've been here for 18 years. If you could please pass this along to the Attorney General. And uh, in those 18 years prosecuting these kinds of cases, this is the most attention that anyone that has ever held this position, I think, has paid to this issue. And it's very much appreciated by those of us on the ground doing this work. So if you can please pass that along uh, to the Attorney General for me, I'd very much appreciate it. Um, there are probably the most challenging aspects uh, when prosecuting a wildlife trafficking case compared to other kinds of trafficking. Um, is that there is a legal trade that exists side by side with the illegal trade. And that employs a complex regulatory scheme. So our cases frequently require us to parse through complex regulations, uh, differentiate between legal and illegal trade. Um, this legal trade provides cover for the otherwise illegal activity. It makes detection of the illegal activity more difficult than, in, say, other kinds of crime. You know. There's no legal market for a kilo of cocaine, um, but there is a legal market for many of the items that are trafficked. So that is one of the challenges you know, we face every day. And this leads into, you know, to prosecute under our laws, we have to, person, we have to prove the person knew the wildlife was illegal, generally. Um, again, comparing it to other kinds of crime, you don't have to prove someone knows it's illegal to traffic in a human being, or you don't have to prove someone knew it was illegal to traffic in a kilo of cocaine. It's, it's readily pr provable. Um, so that knowledge, the difficulty in us proving knowledge is often one of the hurdles that we have to overcome. Uh, next, I'd say making juries and judges care. You know, the victims in our cases are not people. It's very easy for a jury or a judge to care about someone who was robbed in a bank or someone who's a victim of violent crime or terrorism. Um, there's not a readily, read, uh, the, the gravity of the crime is not readily identifiable for a lot of judges and juries. Um, it's dealing with animals from other countries. So there's an aspect of why do we care here? So that is a challenge that I think is um, very unique uh, to wildlife trafficking prosecutions. And the last challenge I think is shared with a lot of crimes, I would say, uh, when prosecuting, dealing with cases that involve overseas actors is dealing with corruption. It is just a fact. Uh, corruption related to wildlife trade is, in my opinion, more diffuse and widespread than it is with respect to drugs or other kinds of trafficking because the, the risks for a drug trafficker are so much higher than for a wildlife trafficker. So it, it, there's a 
uh, less of a disincentive for a corrupt government official uh, to uh, agree to do something that they shouldn't do. I was just, uh, an example of this, I was just talking with a prosecutor from the Southern District of California, and she was relating a story where in a case that they had received um, from a country, uh, false, falsified CITES documentation attesting to the legality of certain items that they were attempting to have a prosecution over. And that, um, you know, required them to disprove this item that was provided by this foreign government. Um, you know, that is just a kind of corruption, I think, uh, that is, that is, makes these cases very difficult um, to prosecute. So, Wayne, we've had some great discussions about this dynamic, about criminal prosecution and deterrence. How do you see that working? Do you think uh, environmental criminal prosecution of these cases is an effective deterrent? What are some of those challenges? Um, well, we're talking about in this, in this country, I think that, you know, you're asking a prosecutor, I think criminal prosecution is the best deterrent uh, for trafficking in this country. But, um, uh, and, you know, we do get good sentences in these cases. Um, but I will say that our sentences are often below the guidelines and often below where the uh, guidelines put out say they should be. So, um, you know, the potential sentences are generally good. We have generally good laws on the books. There's a few exceptions where they could be better, but generally they're good. Our guidelines for these cases are generally good. Our agents are great that investigate and put these cases together. Um, but since the sentencing guidelines became advisory, the actual sentences are often less so. Um, and that affects deterrence. And, and I want to give you an example from a case that was recently prosecuted um, by our office with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Um, and there was a defendant trafficker. He had been doing illegal wildlife trafficking for decades, and he was recorded trying to persuade uh, a middleman that he had used not to flip and cooperate against him. Um, and here are quotes. I mean, the best way to, to view this, I think, is from the words of the people doing this kind of illegal trade. So here are the quotes that he was record recorded saying when trying to persuade this other person uh, not to cooperate with the government. He said, you know, I've been there. I've been in front of a grand jury. I've been in court. I've been in tears in front of a judge asking him not to send me to jail. I got busted buying smuggled stuff from Madagascar, pled guilty, and, that, and the judge gave me two years of probation, no fine. And that was a commercial enterprise of smuggling CITES animals, endangered species from Madagascar. He went on to talk about the profit motive that he had. He said, you're talking about a charge that there was a 99% chance you're going to get probation out of this. And in the 25 years I've been doing it, the money that has cost me, the money that's cost me has been less than the money I made doing things that put me at risk. Um, so that, that is the view I think we face sometimes on, on deterrence. It would be helpful to be able to say, to someone who traffics in an endangered species or something valuable, that if you do this, you're going to jail. Um, you know, it would help with deterrence. It would help with investigations because, um, you know, we don't have great leverage to hold over individuals oftentimes to get them to flip and cooperate in investigations. When it's in a drug trafficking scenario or a organized crime scenario, the penalties, generally the risk of the higher penalties are there and that causes greater cooperation. Again, and that's something that um, makes prosecuting these cases more difficult and affects deterrence. Thanks, Wayne. That's great. You mentioned Madagascar. The State Department has identified that nation as one of the top three countries of concern for this issue. So, important case you mentioned there. Thanks for sharing that, um, that story from your experience. Um, let me turn now to Max Marker. Max, from the FBI. Um, everyone knows the FBI has built a tremendous reputation as a world leader in combating transnational organized crime, including uh, drug trafficking. Our audience may be less familiar with uh, the Bureau's counter wildlife trafficking work. Can you tell us a bit about how the FBI uh, prioritizes investigations involving different types of crime, including wildlife cases, and maybe give an example of your organization's role in this fight? Sure. So um, uh, the FBI views uh, wildlife trafficking as a subset of our overall over organized, transnational organized crime efforts. Um, and so we prioritize those efforts in terms of a number of things. One is uh, the, the uh, threat to society, the harm that, that's caused by them, the dollar amount losses, um, as well as sort of our ability to affect uh, that, that harm through an investigation and, and subsequent prosecution. 
Um, so we look at, uh, is there a jurisdiction? Is there uh, an ability for us based on the resource commitment to impact that versus resources that are dedicated to other transnational organized crime threats? So be that human trafficking, trafficking in uh, narcotics or, or what have you. Uh, one of the things that we do find is, is very often um, transnational organized crime groups, because they are profit motivated, they don't stick to trafficking one type of thing. So it may be that as a significant organized crime group, you're trafficking drugs, you're moving people, um, you're also moving uh, wildlife or wildlife products uh, in conjunction with that. Because of um, the fact that uh, we have partners such as Fish and Wildlife, um, Homeland Security Investigation, CBP, uh, as well as the overseas aspects of this crime problem, we view ourselves very much as a partner in the fight. So uh, the typical FBI engagement in a wildlife trafficking investigation will be as a partner to Fish and Wildlife uh, or as a partner to some other government component. And then we will bring our intelligence and investigative resources to bear uh, to that cooperative investigation. Great. No, thank you very much for that. Let me turn to Mark Romley. Mark, the Attorney General referenced you earlier. The department recently and for the first time deployed a resident legal advisor specifically tasked with wildlife trafficking issues uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, an area where this is reaching crisis proportions in terms of the markets. And you have the uh, good fortune to be the first DOJ prosecutor tapped for that job here in Laos. So thank you for traveling back to visit with us today. Um, I know you've only been there a short time, but have you formed any strong impressions yet on the challenges that law enforcement is facing on the ground <coughs> in those countries? Um, how do you see the commitment of U.S. resources in that region helping with those challenges? And feel free to share any other experiences you might you might have. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and thank you to uh, Bruce Schwartz, uh, who oversees op at the office, office I'm currently working for. Um, by the way, Wayne Hettenbach, who's sitting across the table from me, is my manager at my regular job. So um, it's very interesting to be here with several colleagues, former colleagues, um, <laughs> and sitting up here at the front of the table. Um, <laughs> anyway, I have made some uh, determinations, and I should mention uh, the Environmental Crime Section has been working with uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime for the last four or five years in Southeast Asia. So I don't come fresh to the region. I had some <coughs> experience already from my work with them. Uh, nevertheless, in the last three months, I've just strengthened, I've strengthened my convictions that the problem Wayne mentioned in America about mindset is more pervasive and uh, probably more um, deleterious in Southeast Asia than it is here. They simply do not see wildlife crime as true crime. Um, and there are, uh, that feeling impacts the work they do. Uh, from top to bottom in every agency, it is just as, uh, as Wayne was describing about having to convince judges, they have to convince their bosses that these cases should be done and that they're valuable cases to do. They never realize that the uh, impact on rule of law and the view that the public has of the justice sector in general is affected by the fact that these uh, wildlife criminals in Southeast Asia become folk heroes. Um, they are operating with, that, with uh, impunity. For example, in Laos, within uh, six miles of my house lives one of the biggest traffickers in Southeast Asia. And that, uh, so that touches on another point that the Attorney General already raised, which is mutual legal assistance and transboundary cooperation is lacking. This man is sitting there. He is wanted in Thailand. He's wanted in Africa. He's wanted in several countries. But Laos will not give him up. He is essentially untouchable. Um, and there is evidence that he travels to Thailand frequently. But he's also protected on the Thai side of the border. So. Uh, that is one of the pillars of the counter wildlife trafficking RLA program is to increase uh, is to increase trans border cooperation. So uh, mindset, lack of trans border cooperation, and the third and probably the biggest problem is the lack of prosecutor investigator cooperation. And I should mention that unlike in in the U.S. system where investigators and prosecutors can work together at their will. Um, in many of these countries, their procedure codes are set up to prevent that. Um, 
so that is another part of the CWT program is to identify that gap for them and to help them maybe massage their their procedural codes and their penal codes to allow earlier prosecution involvement because what we are seeing and I've already seen it twice in in the three and a half months I've been there is cases coming to prosecutors and they don't like them so they just die uh, the cases don't go anywhere they aren't kicked back for further investigation even though there are, there are procedures for that to happen in reality it doesn't well since you're there on the ground hopefully one of the things you can do is help motivate that and, and do the capacity building to to generate the support within the institutions and, and allow us to bring those cases is that part of the the program and the effort you you're there to tackle yes very much so uh, case-based mentoring is the way we're referring to that and uh, I can't discuss the details of the case because it hasn't been prosecuted, but we've already we've already had one example in Laos where I was able to step in and help the prosecutors and enforcement agency uh, come to terms. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Let me turn back to Dave just real mm -hmm. quick, because and maybe Todd Willens, if you want to mention something as well. But the Interior Department has been a real leader on this effort as well. So DOJ is placing resident legal advisors, but uh, I know the Secretary of Interior Ryan Zinke has put in place an, uh, an expanded attaché program at embassies in countries of concern and focus countries for this issue. So. I don't know if uh, Todd or Dave want to mention briefly the, the commitments being made there. Absolutely. Uh, uh, our commitment to this issue has, uh, has been ongoing for, for many, many, many years uh, and has ramped up over the last uh, uh, five years with the placement of senior special agents overseas in key locations uh, covering both source, transit, and destination uh, regions. Uh, we currently have seven senior special agents uh, stationed throughout the world at the U.S. embassies uh, in uh, Thailand, China, Tanzania, South Africa, Gabon, Mexico, and Peru. Uh, and as the Attorney General announced in, at the London conference, we're going to be adding five more for a total of 12, uh, which is a, is, a, is a big step for us and in, in I think a showing the, the commitment of the Department of Interior uh, to truly tackle this issue from the global standpoint um, in working with our federal partners, um, uh, federal law enforcement partners that are also stationed overseas on this issue, as well as the Department of Justice and the, and the RLA program. Uh, we were very excited when uh, we found out that the Department of Justice was placing an RLA uh, in Asia specifically on this issue. Our agents work with the RLAs throughout the world that aren't necessarily 100% focused on this issue but as we, uh, I think, are all seeing, they recognize this as a serious transnational organized crime issue with a direct threat to the U.S. and are, uh, are, are putting their resources towards supporting us. Yeah, it's a great program. Thank you so much. Yeah. Todd, did you want to add anything else? No, and I would just say that it's, you know, the other, the other partner in this is Department of State. We right. couldn't have these folks right. in place if we didn't have their cooperation. So it's, they're, they're the other big yeah. partner. That's well. a great, great point. Um, we're really honored to have Bruce Schwartz here. Bruce has a, a long-standing reputation as a leader on this issue, and I really appreciate you taking time to join us. Um, could you share a little bit more about uh, the FBI's legal attache program at various U.S. embassies and what they might be doing on this front? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think with respect to what we're doing internationally, there, there are two aspects to the department's focus. One is the operational side, and the other is the capacity building side. Operationally, um, as Max can speak to, we have uh, FBI legal attaches in embassies around the world. As well, we also have operationally uh, approximately 10 DOJ prosecutors posted in various countries that are there to do mutual legal assistance, extraditions, and to work on these, these cases as well as any other type of criminality. On the capacity building side, uh, we also have DOJ attorneys and police experts stationed in countries around the world, approximately 60 countries. And those capacity building uh, resident legal advisors and senior law enforcement experts, people such as Mark, are funded through the generosity of State Department. Rich Glenn, um, I think personally, I'm sure, is responsible for this. He seems to have endless, uh, endless amounts of money, as far as I can tell, uh, to, to fund this. Um, but those, those individuals perform a number of critical tasks. Uh, they in the first place, as Mark mentioned, looked for gaps in legislation. And that's particularly important in this context, in the, in the context of wildlife trafficking, to make sure that this is treated not just as a criminal offense, but as a serious criminal offense. So that's the starting point. And as Mark mentions, while he's our first, and I hope not our last, 
uh, resident legal advisor that's looking at this issue specifically. We have resident legal advisors funded by State Department's uh, <coughs> International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau around the world that have touched on this issue in one way or the other. We also have police advisors that have been very active in this area. And to cite just two examples, in Indonesia, we've been working for years with their uh, quarantine unit at the, at the border, had had a number of successful operations, including the interception of hundreds of thousands of baby turtles that were being illegally exported. Uh, we've worked in the Philippines with their small boat unit. They, in turn, intercepted illegal fishery boats, Chinese boats that had hawksbill turtles that were being illegally trafficked in endangered species. So we've been on the ground doing this work in countries around the world, but we'd like to do more. And I think the President's executive order, Jeff, as you point out, as the Attorney General pointed out, has done one very important thing, and that's made clear that this is a matter of transnational criminality. This is not simply a, a small scale crime. This is something that transnational crime groups work on. And that's one of the main things that we've been trying to impress on this. So our, our hope is to build out, um, again, with Rich or, or if we can crowdsource it here, um, a network of um, coordinators like Mark around the world. We've done that, for instance, with intellectual property coordinators. So we have prosecutors now stationed around the world focused on that issue, highlighting that issue. And that's exactly the kind of thing we want to be doing uh, in this context as well with State Department support. And we're also on the operational side. We're, where we've brought Fish and Wildlife into um, the International Organized Crime Center here so that we are making sure that this is seen uh, from the outset in our thinking about transnational crime is a key key part of it. And we consider you a charismatic species at the <laughs> ISO. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Alex Q from ICE Homeland Security Investigations, you're uh, also at the tip of the spear um, at HSI on this front. I'd um, like to turn to you and, um, and ask um, what are the greatest challenges that your agency faces in trying to close off uh, transportation routes at the border and elsewhere um, in this arena? First, uh, let me um, just point out that um, ICE, HSI, we're kind of in a very unique position because uh, similar to the FBI in a way, we're not experts at wildlife itself, but we're very adept at transnational criminal organizations and how to investigate them. Uh, what kind of sets HSI apart is that we really focus on uh, things that are related to trade, travel, and finance. Um, so we have, uh, as part of our toolkit, a whole host of law enforcement authorities as well as customs authorities um, that would really uh, be utilized for any really criminal activity that would uh, transcend our borders, but in addition to that uh, is wildlife trafficking. Um, one tool that we have that um, you may or may not know is something called the CMAA, which is the Customs Mutual Assistance Agreement. And uh, there's only two agencies that have that authority, it's CBP and ICE. And what that allows us to do uh, is to exchange information uh, quicker with our partner uh, law enforcement agencies overseas, uh, or I should say customs authorities overseas, and exchange that information. But going back to your uh, original question there, what is the biggest challenge? Uh, because we're in that uh, sandbox that deals with trade, it's the sheer volume. Mm -hmm. And I want to read off some, uh, some uh, stats for you, and you'll kind of get a better understanding of why. And I think Wayne had, uh, um, had pointed out earlier how it's sort of commingled with legitimate commerce. So uh, each year, uh, we have 11 million maritime containers coming into the United States at our seaports. If you add um, the land borders, we have another 10 million arriving by truck, another 3 million arriving by rail. That's a lot of commerce. In addition to that, uh, I don't know if it's, uh, actually I, I, I can surmise that a lot of this has to do with e-commerce and it's continuing to grow, but you're, we're seeing um, more and more contraband being trafficked through air mail. And so if you look at that figure, we've got uh, uh, 250 million or a quarter of a billion additional cargo uh, from postal and express consignment packages arriving. Uh, so a lot of our, you know, aside from wildlife trafficking, for example, other contraband, forms of contraband or uh, counterfeit goods, uh, we're doing a lot of seizures. 89% of our seizures in counterfeits happen at the uh, international mail facilities and express courier services. Again, we believe that a lot of that has to do with things like the dark net, things like uh, online platforms where there's direct-to-consumer um, shipments being made. Uh, containerized cargo is still a big thing. Uh, but uh, for the average consumer that's interested in uh, procuring 
uh, any, tor uh, any type of uh, illicit contraband, um, they tend to shift toward uh, uh, online platforms and, and darknet. Um, yeah. I'm just curious, I mean, just in terms of right. what they're doing to sneak through the smugglers and, and so poachers. Smugglers or smugglers? Uh, whether you're smuggling dope, whether you're smuggling guns, uh, bulk cash, uh, they're going to have certain techniques. I'll, I'll share a few of these. So um, we had a, um, uh, uh, one of our CBP and HSI cases that we worked. It was a sea cucumber case out of Calexico, California. They commingled sea cucumber uh, with dry dog food. So it's just a, another smuggling technique. Uh, another um, case we had uh, these baby cobra snakes. They were still alive. Um, they were smuggled inside of Pringles potato chip cans. Um, elephant ivory tusks being embedded inside of uh, hollowed um, timber <coughs> or, or logs, wooden <coughs> logs. So smuggling techniques are, it is what it is, and we adapt to it. We recognize it. Once, once we recognize a, a new type of smuggling technique, we'll get the word out to CBP uh, inspectors and, and HSI at the ports of entry to be on the lookout for these type of uh, techniques. But um, it, it's as uh, wild as your imagination as far as what they can think of in terms of smuggling. What uh, challenges do you see out there? Do you, um, you see some emerging threats, new, um, new things you need to be aware of? I, I, you know, going back to um, uh, technology, I think, uh, you know, and, and again, don't get me wrong, technology is a great thing, and um, I share with others that for the most part it's a great thing, right? It, it makes our lives better, more convenient, uh, use of time is more efficient. But when criminals get um, uh, to understand technology and sort of harness that, uh, things that we had already mentioned, things like cryptocurrencies and darknet, uh, we're living in a time where criminals can determine how much transparency that they want to expose themselves to in their business. Uh, so if they want to uh, operate on the, the index portions of the Internet, uh, or do they want to go further and be anonymous and use blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies and all that, um, that's what makes it harder. And there's a lot of uh, off-the-shelf, um, pretty sophisticated encryption technologies that are also available that makes traffickers more anonymous. So again, it just adds additional layers for uh, the law enforcement uh, to uh, identify and, and target and to gather uh, evidence, especially digital evidence. Very tough. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah, sure. Uh, has technology changed the way you prosecute at all in terms of helping you? Yes. You and I, and I, I got to throw a, a big kudos out to uh, Dr. Wasser because the, the way, all right, so there's no secret sauce to this, right? So the way HSI has been uh, sort of doing these type of cases is really threefold. One is obviously very um, aggressive investigations and prosecution uh, with uh, working in tandem with all of our partners and DOJ. The other thing is uh, partnerships with academia and, the, and forensic sciences because uh, I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Wasser is going to have a chance to um, uh, divulge this further, but he's been working on some very uh, pioneering and scientific methods of extracting DNA, and it's been, it's been very, very helpful for HSI investigations uh, around the world, um, and it's pretty awesome. Uh, 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 capability and the fact that you can take uh, the DNA samples and sort of triangulate where that harvest was illegally obtained from within I think it was a 300 uh, kilometer range which is pretty tight all things considered so um, the other thing that they were doing um, uh, DHS Department of Homeland Security just um, named I think it was Texas A&M and University of Washington um, both of those universities were selected to establish a center of excellence for cross-border threat screening and supply chain defense. And again, this is new technology that they're actually piloting that would, that would allow for non-intrusive inspection and detection of these types of contraband uh, without having to break open any security seals. So what does that do for, for agencies like HSI and CBP that are at the ports of entry? Expedited inspections more targeted inspections, more strategic inspections. So you can imagine, as Wayne had mentioned before, when you have a needle in a haystack moving, we have to figure out other ways to kind of develop technology, harness technology, because the crooks are doing it too. As they advance, we have to evolve as well. So I can't, ex I can't really um, uh, explain how, how important really it is to, to uh, work with academia, because they have that subject matter expertise. And, to Fish and Wildlife um, and, and NOAA and some, so many other agencies, again, they are actually experts on that topic. That's why the vast majority of HSI cases do involve other agencies. We're the experts as far as the transit, but we still need their expertise in all of these uh, wildlife areas.
And if I could just add to Alex's point, as many of you may have seen, the National Science Foundation just last month announced a new initiative looking at illicit networks and taking the approach that they need to take operational research, operational engineering that's been used to make networks uh, more effective to see if we can use them to make illicit networks less effective. So about 10 grants have gone out. They are very interested in working with U.S. law enforcement, with those involved in this area. So we'd be glad to put you in touch with those researchers. I think your point is well taken. It's, it's key that we have the engineers, social scientists, the operational researchers addressing this issue. That's great. And you mentioned one of those researchers, Dr. Wasser. You're yeah. here from Washington. Thank you for, for, for being here and traveling so far. Um, his research focuses on on really the, the information we need to tackle the enforcement challenges we face, knowing where it's coming from, who's sourcing it, tracking it, and he's a leader in that field. So thank you for being here, Dr. Wasser. Um, in the final few minutes we have, I wanted to bring in one of our NGO uh, partners um, into the discussion. So Crawford, uh, Alan, you're here from the group Traffic, which is one of the um, leading wildlife trafficking NGOs. Um, Many NGOs have become directly involved in law enforcement efforts, especially in wildlife trafficking hotspots, even to the point sometimes of joining case teams and assisting in case development. Um, that's certainly true of your organization, Traffic, as you partner with, with law enforcement to make sure they have the resources and information they need to bring good cases. What types of challenges are NGOs like Traffic seeing on the ground? And um, are we identifying the right challenges um, in this discussion as we think about moving forward? Department of Justice and to the Attorney General, um, if you can pass the mic, that would be helpful. I'm a small guy with a delicate voice. <laughs> uh, thank you very much indeed. So, yeah, I mean, it's so good to be here, and, and thank you for, the, for these insights. I can certainly um, appreciate and understand some of the comments from Department of Justice particularly. That is what also, I think, civil society groups like mine are also seeing on the ground. And um, it is actually critical that... Um, more of this capacity building in particular is, is, is put into play. We've seen every time um, that U.S. government resources are applied on the ground around the world to support law enforcement efforts that there are results and impact um, to a differing degree, but very often to a very great extent. And the only challenge as we see it in that is that whilst um, the resources that are delivered are, are so essential, we just need to keep that coming. Because I think if that, those resources and those skills that the U.S. is supporting and applying on the ground were to dry up, I don't know what would happen for the sake of wildlife, because clearly um, the cutting-edge solutions that are being provided um, are making a marked difference. So I just wanted to thank you for that and for the investment that you've done. Um, and particularly if you're looking at the prosecution side, we see so many challenges there with just not enough prosecution, prosecutors, not enough expertise, not enough, no guidelines, no training, um, the disconnects between investigation and prosecution. Um, and again, I want to address that issue of corruption. I mean, it's just corruption, corruption, corruption. When you have organized crime groups that are, are, are running all the convergence of different types of crime, um, they have the money and resources to buy out in some of these lesser developed countries, the judiciary. And unfortunately, that leads to a massive um, uh, lack of confidence in the judiciary and trust in that, which then undermines the whole process of what is the point of bringing prosecutions to court. Um, it's true for wildlife perhaps more than other things where, in fact, as you've heard already, that wildlife is not deemed to be such an important and serious crime. Um, I think other things we talked about forensics, and I think the forensics work is something that it's very difficult to bring forensics evidence to court and to use it and apply it effectively, particularly where that evidence may be uh, provided from overseas. And so it, there, are, there are difficulties in that, and it needs to be um, supported through training and capacity building to help that happen. Um, I think one of the other things that we're seeing from um, U.S. leadership here is that the U.S. has been in this game the longest of anybody. The U.S. has been investing more than anybody. You therefore know more than most about what is happening around the world and what needs to be done. But I wonder, do we have the right skills and tools and abilities to bring that learning together to figure out um, what really needs to be done next? And so this platform is a perfect example of where you've recognized that and need to bring that forward. But I also think there are other ways. I mean, you have this incredible task force of agencies. It's a model for other countries. Uh, we don't see anything like that to that extent, where you bring the agencies together to tackle this singular issue. 
um, it's commendable. But I also wonder whether there is more of a way you could have a formalized system where you can bring in civil society that can actually, who are on the ground around the world, to feed into you about what really is happening. What is the horizon scanning? Yes, we've got the End Act. It's a fantastic piece of legislation. Um, it brings in so many strengths. But, and it targets particular countries. But the fact is, as we know, criminals change, they move, their trends are shifting all the time. I think with horizon scanning that was being done by um, NGOs, this could really help feed in maybe on a six-month basis an advisory group, uh, maybe not, not a formal federal one, but a, a, some sort of system to feed into the task force. What are the NGOs hearing? What is the new trend in wildlife? What are the new trafficking routes? What are the new challenges? Uh, where has there been evidence of corrupt practice in certain countries that could help give you the tip-offs you need to help steer and prioritize your efforts? Thank you for that. Thank you, Crawford, for being, being here. Um, you mentioned the task force. It's the President's Task Force on Wildlife Trafficking. We've been meeting. A lot of the folks in this room are part of that task force, and we've produced reports that have gone up to the Hill as well as throughout the administration to help identify those issues that we need to be uh, focused on to try to move this, um, this issue in the right direction. I know the President's committed to this issue um, as his executive order early in his administration demonstrates, and we are committed to continuing this fight. So uh, we've now reached the end of our first roundtable discussion. Let me take a moment to thank all of you who joined us online at DOJ Live. More information about today's event and our division's work on this vital issue is available at www.justice.gov slash ENRD. This will now end the live program. At this time, we'll adjourn for five minutes to allow you all to stretch. There are bathrooms down the hall. Please return promptly before 11.06 a.m. It's in five minutes so that we can begin the film presentation. Thank you. And this also concludes the open press portion of the event. Rest, restrooms are to the left, across past the elevators.